afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business today is portfolio questions. And the portfolio question subject today is rural affairs. Question one, Ken McIntosh. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has made an assessment of the environmental impact of cutting business rates relief for the renewables industry. Minister Aileen MacLeod. Uh, the Scottish Government does not expect any environmental impact. I would thank the Minister for her reply, although I have to say I am surprised. Her colleague Margaret Burgess, uh, MSP, has confirmed that the Government is going to cut £10 million. This will cost £10 million, mostly to the small and medium-sized companies operating in the sector. Does the Minister not think it a little hypocritical to be complaining so bitterly about the UK Government's decision to end the renewables obligation, while sim simultaneously taking £10 million out of the sector? And how... What sort of impact does she think that cutting £10 million will have on our ability to meet our carbon emission targets? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. This has been a, a difficult decision in a very difficult uh, budget. The renewables industry in Scotland has benefited from relief since 2010, which was unique for the UK. We have had to target our stretched funds to those most in need, including uh, community schemes, while uh, balancing the needs of the renewable sector uh, with other non-domestic uh, rates payers. Now, we don't expect uh, renewable projects, which will no longer be receiving the rate relief, to stop generating as their main source of income generation would be via the feed-in tariff or the renewables obligation. We do not expect there to be any impact on existing projects and the role they play in providing uh, low carbon and cost effective energy as part of a balanced generation uh, mix. Many thanks. Question two, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the proposed camping management bylaws for the Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park. Minister Amy McLeod. Uh, the Scottish Government approved new camping management bylaws on the 26th of January, covering a small area of the National Park as part of a package of measures aimed at improving uh, visitor facilities and helping uh, manage camping in some of the most environmentally fragile areas which are suffering from damage caused by a combination of high volume and antisocial camping. Lord, Lord, Lord. As the Minister will recall, I wrote to her in November 2015, following a large number of representations received from my constituents who expressed concern about bylaw affecting camping in the National Park. They believe that such proposals were an infringement on their rights and could potentially lead to further restrictions and unfairly penalise the vast majority of those individuals who adhere to and comply with the Scottish Outdoor Access Code. Can the Minister, therefore, give me an assurance that individual legal rights of access as established in the Land Reform Act of 2003 are not being undermined and that no precedent has been set for introducing any further restrictions in our national parks? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. These measures should not be confused with the intentions behind the Land Reform Scotland Bill. These bylaws deal with specific circumstances within a national park where steps must be taken to prevent environmental damage caused by a combination of overuse and irresponsible behaviour. Now, both the National Park Scotland Act 2000 and the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 make provision for bylaws in relation to responsible uses of land. Access rights must be exercised responsibly, but unfortunately, certain areas of the National Park are suffering from considerable environmental damage and local communities are having to deal with the negative impacts of the worst excesses of irresponsible uh, behaviour. The proposals to manage uh, camping activity, these are designed to promote recreational access for all types of users, not just campers in the proposed uh, management zones. And the measures within the National Park do not affect access rights in other parts of the country. And there's no evidence that the East Loch Lomond bylaws led to calls for similar bylaws to be considered elsewhere in Scotland. Okay, thanks. Question three, Stuart Maxwell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to deal with antibiotic resistance in the food chain. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. The Scottish Government has signed up to the UK five year antimicrobial strategy for 2014 2018, which is produced in collaboration with public health and animal health authorities across the UK. The strategy combines actions in the human and animal health environments, and a working group has been set up, chaired by the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, and is developing detailed plans to implement that. The Scottish Government also monitors scientific developments in antimicrobial resistance, liaises with other administrations and public bodies who have all got an interest in animal health, public health eh, and food safety. And of course, we implement a veterinary surveillance programme that monitors the emergence of such resistance in animals. 
Thank you very much. Stuart Maxwell. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that detailed and comprehensive answer? However, given the possible variability and the implications for different sectors, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me if the Scottish Government has investigated the economic impact on the farming sector of a rise in antimicrobial resistance in different forms of livestock, for example, poultry, cattle or sheep? Cabinet Secretary. Well, due to the fact that we very much view this issue through the prism of the impact on public health, there's been no such economic strategy on our livestock sectors in Scotland because it's not deemed to be an issue at the moment. However, I certainly think you know, it's something, no doubt, that ministers and the agencies and public bodies involved with this issue over uh, will want to reflect upon as this debate moves forward. Thanks. Question four, Alex Ferguson. Uh, thank you, presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met NFU Scotland and what matters were discussed. Secretary. Representatives of the Scottish Government met with NFU Scotland uh, in numerous occasions over the last few months to discuss a wide range of topics. Uh, the most recent meeting took place on the 29th of January in, in Perth to discuss cap payments. Uh, I also, of course, delivered a speech at the NFU Scotland AGM on the 12th of February, uh, and during that I announced, of course, the £20 million pounds hardship fund uh, as well. Um, well, uh, I'm not surprised that the subject was on cap payments because the shambles of the basic payment scheme continues and with less than 1,000 payments a week being cleared, paying all claimants 70% of their basic payments by the end of March as promised is looking increasingly unlikely, if not impossible. But farmers are now beginning to ask what impact this is all going to have on other schemes, specifically the less favoured area support scheme payment, which is normally paid in March. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary a very simple question? When will this year's LFAS payments be made? I should inform uh, Alec Ferguson and the members that we are now approaching 50% uh, of farmers and crofters in Scotland will have received their first instalment, which is equivalent to 80% of their overall uh, greening and basic payments. Uh, however, uh, it is indeed the case that there will be a knock-on impact for other schemes. I have been very open and clear about that, given this is the transition year between the, the former common agricultural policy and the new far more complex common agricultural policy, notwithstanding the fact that also the IT system is not working as quickly as we had hoped, uh, and of course another, a range of other factors uh, as well. LFAS is normally paid in March. I recognise the extreme importance of that payment. Uh, to hill farmers in particular uh, in Scotland, and that is why I am paying a lot of attention to that uh, as we speak. Uh, so whilst I have said that all other schemes will have a knock-on impact of several weeks, I am paying particular attention to LFAS to see how we can minimise the impact in that particular scheme. Thanks. Sarah Blatt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When will the Cabinet Secretary take decisive action? Because we have now got farmers with expensive bank loans that they are having to shoulder because this system has been a failure. Um, can you give us an update on exactly when all farmers will get all their payments? Um, and will you recompense farmers who have had to take out expensive loans to get themselves through the system? Because this is impacting on rural communities across the whole country. Uh, thank you. I, mean, I, I should make the obvious point that I can't really be lectured by the Labour Party who, when in government at UK level, did their utmost to scrap direct payments to Scottish farmers and crofters. And it's therefore a bit hypocritical to constantly criticise the Scottish Government on the payment timetable for payments they don't want to exist uh, in the first place. However, it is a serious issue and it is having a serious impact uh, on ca cash flow situations uh, across Scotland. Uh, we are working flat out to get as many of the first instalments out by the end of March. As I have said, we are approaching 50 per cent uh, as we speak and will continue to uh, do our utmost to, to speed up uh, the process. As you know, we cannot call down the money from Europe to pay farmers and crofters until we have sorted out all the processing of the applications and addressed any errors or whatever may exist with each application form under what is a very complex system. Uh, and therefore, we simply can't award the payments until that process has been carried out. Nevertheless, we are approaching 50 per cent uh, at the moment. In terms of decisive action, I have said that the £20 million that we announced at the NFU AGM will be available for genuine hardship cases. If any farmer or crofter is unable to get finance from their bank and then they take evidence of that to the government, they will be able to access the £20 million fund. We have agreed that to stakeholders because that is the most sensible thing to do. Uh, the vast majority of farmers and crofters, uh, as we are aware, have a good relationship with their banks. The payment window for this overall scheme is from the 1st of December to the end of June this year. Clearly, in previous years, we had a very good record of paying out in December, but it's the transition year, and therefore we're further into that payment window than in previous years. I wish we were moving a lot more further than what we are, but we are where we are, and we're doing absolute utmost to get payments out the door. Many thanks. Tammy Scott. 
Thank you. If the Minister's uh, Cabinet Secretary is uh, moving everything he can, will he undertake to either write to individual crofters and farmers who have yet to know either how much they are getting or when they will get it as quickly as he possibly can, particularly if this is going to slip into April, May or indeed, as he has just said, June? And as, as with Alec Ferguson's question, can he not just tell Parliament today whether he will make LFAS payments in March or just come clean with the industry and say, sorry, but it is going to be April? Because that would at least tell crofters and hill, and hill farmers uh, how to plan financially for that eventuality. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I accept the need for, for as much clarity as possible. Clearly, we are unable to give a timetable to individual recipients for their own application because each and every day more recipients across Scotland get their payment. Therefore, any letter would be out of date as soon as it was sent to many farmers and crofters uh, in Scotland. In terms of LFAS, I have said that normally it is paid out in March, but it is running a few weeks behind schedule. But I am currently, as we speak, actively trying to speed up that process to minimise the knock-on impact for LFAS. I am meeting stakeholders again uh, next week. I hope to be in a better position at that point in terms of the LFAS payments in particular to give more clarity uh, on the timescale for that. Many thanks. Question five, Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in introducing a ban on the use of wild animals in circuses. Government Secretary. The Scottish Government takes the welfare of animals, including circus animals, very seriously. There are no travelling circuses with wild animals presently based in Scotland. However, some do visit Scotland on occasion, and we are aware that many people have concerns about the welfare of animals. The results of the Scottish Government's consultation showed overwhelming support for a ban on the use of wild animals in travelling circuses on ethical grounds. As this would require legislation, I am considering the best way forward at the moment, and the Scottish Government will set out our plans in due course, and certainly before the dissolution of Parliament. Um, uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Uh, one of the things which I am afraid of is that the Cabinet Secretary uh, may be waiting for legislation uh, to be uh, put into practice in England, uh, and we deal with this in an LCM. I do not think that is going to happen soon. So I am glad that the Cabinet Secretary has said that he is going to lay out a timetable. Can he give us an indication of when that is going to be? He says before dissolution. Is that likely much before dissolution, or are we going to hear this sooner? It is certainly the case back in November 2012, DEFRA wrote to the Scottish Government and indeed other devolved administrations signalling uh, their intention to develop a bill to ban the use of wild animals in travelling circuses and offering to extend the territorial scope of the bill uh, in terms of including Scotland clearly in that case. Uh, however, we will do what is best for Scottish circumstances and I will make clear before dissolution of Parliament our own timetable for legislating uh, in this country once we work out what the best way forward is indeed in terms of how to, to frame any legislation we may wish to support. And I will not be influenced by the timetables elsewhere in the UK. Many thanks. Question 6, Cara Hilton. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle air pollution in Fife. Minister Aileen MacLeod. And the Scottish Government continues to work closely with Fife Council, SEPA, Transport Scotland and other partners to improve air quality in Fife. Fife Council has produced an air quality action plan for the Cooper Air Quality Management Area, which is regularly cited as an example of best practice. The plan contains a comprehensive range of measures, including an effective public awareness raising campaign. The plan has contributed to reducing uh, pollutant levels to the extent that no exceedances of the objectives uh, for nitrogen dioxide or particulate matter were recorded during 2014. An action plan for Fife's other air quality management area at Apen Crescent, Dunfermline, is also in place, which aims to mirror the success in Cooper, which has had no exceedances uh, were recorded during 2014. Um, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Given the evidence that air pollution causes at least 2,000 early deaths in Scotland each year, and many areas still continue to have dangerous levels of air pollution, such as up and present in my and Fremont constituency, what extra funding will the Scottish Government be making available to make active travel a more realistic option, and in particular to improve safe routes for pedestrians and cyclists to public transport links? And given that the Scottish Government is planning to spend 200 times as much on building new roads as in tackling air pollution in the budget today, how likely is it that we will meet air, European air quality limits by 2020, as has been promised? Minister. 
On tackling local air pollution is also uh, a matter for the local authorities with support and guidance provided by the Scottish Government and other partners. The Scottish Government provides practical support to local authorities through our policy and technical guidance and financial support through a series of annual funding schemes. Now, since 2000, Fife Council has received around £530,000 in total to support air quality monitoring and associated work, plus around £520,000 since 2010 to help implement the action plans in Cooper and in Fermanagh. And many actions are being implemented at a national level, which are having a positive impact uh, locally uh, across Scotland, such as the Green Bus Fund and obviously the, the plug-in uh, vehicles uh, roadmap. In terms of the budget, I'm sure we have our stage three budget this afternoon, which I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will uh, say more about that. But compared to 2013-14, you know, we have increased investment in active travel uh, by over 80%, from £21.35 million pounds for 2013-14 to £39.2 million pounds in 2015-16. And that is at a time when our overall capital budget has decreased by 26%. You know, the Scottish Government invests over a billion pounds per year in our public and sustainable transport to encourage people onto public transport and active travel modes. And we have also invested 11 million pounds in the development of the Charge Place Scotland network of electric vehicle charging points, which now comprises over 400 units, with many more commissioned, being commissioned over the coming months. Next question, seven, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact it expects its proposals on land reform to have in West Scotland region. Sir. Minister Ailey McLeod. Uh, the Land Reform Bill currently before Parliament will result in real improvements in how land is owned, used and managed across Scotland. Land ownership by communities has gone from strength to strength and there are impressive examples of community buyouts throughout the country. In the west of Scotland, for example, in 2006, the Neilston Community Trust registered an interest and then purchased a former bank building which continues to be used as a community hub and resource as well as office space. More recently, in 2014, the Arran Community Land Initiative saw the acquisition of 79 acres to develop a community woodland on the island. So building on successes like this, the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015 provides for the extension and streamlining of the community right to buy process and for the first time, urban communities will be able to use the statutory community right to buy. And through the legislation and the government's one million acre strategy, we anticipate that many more communities, the length and breadth of Scotland, including in the west of Scotland region, will be able to realise the many benefits from acquiring land. And obviously the revised community right to buy legislation is coming into force on the 15th of April this year. Thanks, Mary Fee. I thank the Minister for that answer. Will the Minister give her clear support and indicate a timescale for introducing compulsory, <coughs> excuse me, compulsory sale orders so that local authorities can take the lead in bringing vacant and derelict land back into use, particularly for town centres and rural communities? Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I think, as I've already indicated uh, during our uh, Stage 1 uh, debate, that we are uh, supportive of the issue of compulsory sale orders and we are currently uh, considering the issue uh, around this. We are supportive of them because we can see that vacant and derelict land and or buildings being brought back into uh, use. But in terms of being able to bring forward an effective um, compulsory sales order that will take time and careful consideration to ensure that it is effective and within competence. Now, if re-elected, re uh, this government would actively explore bringing forward proposals uh, for a compulsory sale order forward in the next term of government as part of this government's wider land reform programme. Many thanks. Question 8, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding the impact that leaving the EU could have on Scotland's fishing and farming communities. Government Secretary Richard Lockhead. The UK Government has not consulted the Scottish Government about the impact the UK exit from the EU would have on Scotland's fishing and farming communities nor, I believe, has it directly consulted those communities that would be directly affected. EU membership provides a range of benefits which include direct access to financial assistance, free access to a common food export market of over 500 million consumers, and the protection of opportunities offered by being part of a major global trading bloc. Thanks. Colin Beattie. Can the Cabinet Secretary highlight some of the benefits EU membership brings to Scotland's farming and fishing communities? Well, clearly in terms of support for agriculture, uh, we have billions of euros making its way to Scottish 
uh, farmers and crofters and wider rural communities between now and 2020 that, of course, would not otherwise be there, given its UK policy to scrap direct payments and were only protected by EU membership. And that is one direct benefit for uh, the agricultural sector in terms of uh, seafood. Clearly, many of our seafood exporters rely on the European markets. And I have to just say it is fascinating to note that the UK Farming Minister, George Eustace, has just declared for the Leave campaign, uh, having said just a couple of weeks ago or so that it was up to the Leave campaign to explain what would happen to cap payments in the event of the UK leaving Europe. So therefore, I laid down the challenge to him today. Can you please explain to Scotland's form, uh, farmers and crofters what will happen to the billions of euros that make their way to Scotland if indeed the UK leaves Europe? Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions on rural affairs, food and the environment. And we now move to portfolio questions rather on justice and law officers. Question one, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure equal access to justice in environmental matters. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. The Scottish Government has undertaken a significant programme of reform to the justice system with the aim of making the court system more efficient and accessible. The Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014 codifies recent changes to standing, i.e. entitlement to bring a case. The result is a clear, broader entitlement to make a case, take a case to court, which we expect will benefit those with an interest in public interest litigation, including cases concerned with environmental matters. However, seeking redress through the courts may involve considerable cost, and this is mitigated by the ability to access legal aid, if eligible, and to apply to the court for a protected, uh, protective expenses order, or PEO, in certain cases, including certain environmental cases. A PEO protects the litigant from any expense beyond the limit set out in the PEO. We are also progressing plans to publish a consultation paper on options covering areas such as the potential role of an environmental court or tribunal. Thanks. Alison Johnson. I thank the Minister for his response because this is a vital issue. The Aarhus Convention exists because the environment can't go to court itself. People must protect it, sometimes with legal action. But as you'll be aware, this can be prohibitively expensive by anyone's reckoning. I agree that a specialist environmental court could and would help. The Justice Committee support one, the SNP manifesto promised an options paper, and the Scottish Government have repeatedly told Parliament that one is coming, but still we have no paper and no timeline. Will the Parliament see one before Perda? Minister. I can certainly, I certainly agree with a lot of what Alison Johnson said in terms of the purpose of uh, justice in protecting the environment. Clearly, it doesn't have a voice of its own, and I recognise that. Uh, certainly, on the point about the manifesto commitment, it is our intention to publish a consultation paper prior to, to dissolution of Parliament. Thanks. Uh, Rod Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister has largely answered my question, but can I welcome the commitment to the publication of an options paper? I look forward to seeing that before the dissolution of Parliament. Yes, sir. Certainly, uh, Presiding Officer, I would ha happily confirm that. Uh, I appreciate Mr Campbell's interest in this issue and indeed that of other members of the Chamber, and we will uh, fulfil our commitment. Question two, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to improve the prison state. Cabinet Secretary Michael Maths. I recently announced plans for the redevelopment of the women's custodial estate. In addition, the Scottish Prison Service will progress its estate development plan it described within the Scottish Government's infrastructure investment plan to deliver a fit-for-purpose prison estate. Many thanks. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. And, uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that um, we have had discussions in the past regarding the replacement for the uh, HMP uh, Greenock uh, with uh, substantial uh, investment already made in the, uh, in the initial uh, site uh, and also with uh, the current HMP Greenock having a limited lifespan. I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary can provide um, any assurances to the people in the West of Scotland uh, in terms of uh, a replacement for HMP Greenock is certainly firmly in the Scottish Government's uh, plans for the future. Officer, the uh, site at Inverclyde uh, remains available to the Scottish Prison Service for uh, the replacement of uh, HMP uh, Greenock, which is one of the prisons which they have identified uh, that requires to be uh, replaced. Uh, for the uh, replacement of that particular facility, obviously uh, a detailed plan would need to be brought forward uh, and for the SPS then to secure capital uh, funding for that particular course um, of action. Uh, but that site at Inverclyde remains in the ownership of the SPS 
uh, and it would be available to the SPS should they use, choose to use that site uh, for a replacement of HMP Greenock in the future. Many thanks. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that issues were raised about the unacceptable conditions of the toilet for remand prisoners at Conton Vale by members of the former prisoning visiting committees. Given complaints about the prison estate and other issues are now covered by the new independent prison monitoring service, can he comment on the reported problems with this new service, which include poor implementation of reforms and inadequate communication and can he provide assurances that the government will address these issues with immediate effect? Um, well, I presume that the member is making reference to uh, the Inspectorate's uh, recent report of uh, HMP at Compton Vale uh, which highlighted a number of areas where uh, it should also be recognised significant improvement has been made in Compton Vale and I think we should uh, put on record the fact that significant improvement has been made as a result of the actions of the staff at Compton Vale, but equally also highlighted areas where further improvements need to be made and uh, the issue around uh, night sanitation was highlighted. The member will be uh, aware that the Scottish Prison Service uh, have uh, proposed the uh, women, uh, while they start the decommissioning process at Compton Vale, that uh, just over half of the women from Compton Vale will be relocated to uh, to the Young Offenders Institution in uh, Pullman. I have approved that proposal, uh, which will be implemented um, over the coming months and should be taken forward by this uh, summer. That will allow, uh, in particular, those women who have issues around uh, problems around night sanitation facilities at Compton Vale to be relocated to uh, Pullman, while the SPS then start the decommissioning of uh, the Compton Vale facility with a view to creating and building the new national facility uh, for 80 women uh, in the next couple of years. Thanks. Graham Pearson. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary has set out to, in general his plans for improving the estate. Can you give us any indication uh, in light of the Government's continued commitment to reduce the prison population? Uh, although it stayed at stubbornly the same level over the last five years. What impact reducing the population will have on his plans and what timescales does he know in relation to re that reduction? Minister. Well, the uh, first thing is that the member is factually wrong is that the prison population over the last couple of years has actually declined. It has stabilised, uh, but it has had been a decline um, over recent years. So the uh, member, first of all, is incorrect on that matter. Uh, the member will also be aware in the uh, programme that we have set out for the rebuilding of uh, the new uh, female custodial estate that that will reduce our capacity within the female uh, estate considerably. And a key part of that is because we are placing greater focus on community alternative disposals in order to, which we know are much more effective in tackling offending behaviour uh, as a means in which we can seek to reduce our prison population overall. Uh, so that will be a key part of the approach that we take forward with the redesign of the custodial estate alongside a greater focus on using more effective, robust community disposals which will help to reduce re-offending rates in Scotland, which are incidentally at a 16-year low as a result of the progress that we have made over recent years. What I want to do is to build on that and to accelerate that yet further. Uh, and part of that will assist us in helping to reduce the, the female prison estate and the male uh, population overall in Scotland. Question three, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the Cash Back for Communities programme is having in the north east of Scotland. Uh, officer, we are rightly proud of our unique Cash Back for Communities programme and have published information by local authority area on the Cash Back website. Uh, this demonstrates that up to the end of March 2015, uh, young people from the northeast of Scotland, uh, which includes the local authority areas of Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, Angus, Dundee City and parts of Murray, have directly benefited from nearly £5.5 million of cash back investment delivering over 250,000 activities and opportunities for young people in the northeast of Scotland. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Um, may I very much welcome the 5.5 million that has been recycled from the pockets of criminals uh, for the benefit of uh, public good in the northeast of Scotland, as indeed elsewhere across Scotland. Uh, can the minister indicate uh, what criteria he is likely to wish seeing used uh, for future selection of cashback projects. 
Uh, officer, the approach we have taken uh, over the last three phases of uh, allocating cash back money has been to work with partner organisations, of which there are 14 who are responsible for uh, running projects across the country. That ranges from sporting organisations right through to uh, cultural organisations and youth uh, groups. And they uh, have a particular focus on areas which are uh, deprived and where there are disadvantaged uh, young people. We are presently at the, coming towards the end of the phase three of that funding, which, will, uh, which goes up to March 2017, and I'm presently considering the arrangements for phase four of that particular programme. I want to ensure that it is much more targeted on deprived areas. It has a focus on assisting us in reducing inequalities within our communities, and in doing so, maximising the benefit for the communities that can come from the cashback scheme. There is no doubt officer, that this has been an extremely successful uh, programme of taking money from criminals and putting it back into our communities. And we intend to make sure that we build on uh, the important work we have achieved over recent years with the cashback programme. Thanks. Question four, Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support the justice system gives to people with autism. Mr Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to improving the lives of people with autism. For those coming into contact with the criminal justice system, the support of an appropriate adult is available to individuals over 16 years of age. Their role includes facilitating understanding or communication for an accused person, suspect, victim or a witness with autistic spectrum disorder during police procedures. For those under 16, support would be offered by a responsible adult. To assist vulnerable individuals giving evidence in court, there is now greater access to special measures, including the use of screens or giving evidence via video link. Similar measures are also available for the purposes of giving evidence in civil proceedings. Uh, tribunal hearings tend to be more informal and will be flexible in the arrangements to support vulnerable people giving evidence. Thanks, Christina McKelvey. Can I can I thank the Minister for, for that answer? And he obviously demonstrates very clearly that anyone who uh, has uh, an autism spectrum uh, disorder faces particular barriers when accessing any system. Could you maybe give us an update on what training is available for frontline police officers, for fiscals and fiscal staff to ensure that if a person, victim or alleged perpetrator, is given the correct support to ensure that justice is, is, is given? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I will certainly write uh, to Christina McKelvey with more detail on this, but training is clearly a vital issue when dealing with those with particular needs, and I do thank the member for raising this really important issue. I understand that representatives from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service have recently been in touch with the National Autistic Society for Scotland, with a view to developing training and policy in relation to how to sta staff to interact with those with autism. As the training of fiscals and other staff is a matter for the Crown Office, however, I would be more than happy to raise the members' concerns with Lord Advocate, who may wish to provide further information on this. But in addition, uh, I am aware that the uh, Scottish Police uh, Force, uh, prior to the creation of uh, Police Scotland, did take, uh, undertake training in 2010, and Police Scotland does remain uh, engaged with uh, the Autism Network Scotland and continues to identify and share good practice in localities. But as I say, I will write with further detail to the member. Question 5, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the police are doing to tackle noise uses in domestic properties. Minister Paul. Uh, responsibility for dealing with the majority of complaints about domestic noise rests with the local authorities who have a duty uh, to investigate such complaints under the provisions of the Environmental Protection Act 1990 or, depending on the uh, nature of the complaint, the noise provisions under Part 5 of the Antisocial Behaviour uh, etc. Scotland Act 2004. In some instances, the police can become involved. Legislation grants authorised officers and local authorities with various powers to deal with noise nuisance. Under the antisocial behaviour legislation, an officer may issue a warning notice to the person responsible for excessive noise. If the warning notice is not complied with, other measures available include fixed penalty notices or the power to enter premises to seize noise-making equipment. Abatement notices are also available under the provisions of the Environmental Protection Act 1990. Thank you. George Adam. I thank the Minister for his response. Is the Minister aware that re one of the most regular complaints I receive is that of noise from useless neighbours and constituents are moved from police to local authority trying to find a solution? But unless the local authority actually catches the person in the act, then my constituents are told that nothing can be done for them and I have seen families torn apart and children sleeping at their grandparents' home just to get a decent night's sleep. Does the Minister agree with me that local authorities should and could be doing far more to assist people when dealing with this issue? Minister. 
Uh, well, certainly, can I firstly say I'm very sorry to hear the experience of Mr Adams' constituents in Paisley, as clearly uh, the, the situation described by Mr Adam is, would be very distressing in terms of dealing with uh, neighbours' noise. And the local authority uh, perhaps has been unable to resolve the situation to their satisfaction. But I have uh, every sympathy with those suffering from uh, such a situation. I fully agree it's unacceptable uh, that those strains are being placed in normal family life caused by the actions of inconsiderate uh, and selfish behaviour of, of neighbours. But when a local authority investigates a noise complaint, they must consider the facts and circumstances of each case when deciding what action to take. I am aware uh, an environmental health officer must either witness the noise or be in a position to measure the level of noise to determine whether the law is being breached. In cases where it's not been possible to witness or measure the noise as it happens, local authorities uh, may install recording equipment in homes to establish whether acceptable levels are being breached and enable them to, uh, to take appropriate enforcement action. Uh, my officials have uh, been in contact with Renfrewshire Council and have been informed by the Council that they do provide the service, but clearly, given the experience of Mr Adams' constituents, that may not be widely known, and there may be a, a case for actually making sure that the neighbours are notified that this is, a, this is a potential solution to the problem, to build the evidence base. Thanks. Question six, Joanna MacLeod. To ask the Scottish Government how the Justice Directorate is tackling violence against women. Minister, Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The Scottish Government is committed to tackling and eradicating violence against women and girls. Uh, we have committed £20 million over the period of 2015 to 2018 from the Justice Portfolio to support a range of projects and initiatives. We are strengthening the law in this area and seeking views on a new specific offence of domestic abuse. We have established the Equally Safe Joint Strategic Board, uh, which will drive forward real and lasting change through key areas such as justice and prevention. As a government, however, we recognise that to truly achieve our goal, enhancing the justice system in isolation is not enough. It is through tackling the root causes of gender inequality in all aspects of our life that we will realise our true goal of eradicating violence against women and girls. Thanks. Fiona McLeod. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, comprehensive amount of work that we're doing? Could I further ask the Cabinet Secretary how the Scottish Government is supporting children and young people who witness domestic violence? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, I'm grateful to the issue which the member has raised, which is an important uh, matter, because uh, we have to remember that uh, a whole family can be severely affected by domestic abuse, especially uh, children, uh, where children have been involved. In terms of the support for victims, there are a range of existing measures uh, to support vulnerable witnesses through our justice system, including uh, children who witness domestic abuse. Uh, and additionally, to assist children who are giving evidence, uh, for example, um, all those under 18 are entitled to supportive measures, um, with, such as screening and through other uh, video link systems in order to assist them as we move through the court process. Additionally to this, the Children's Services Fund uh, supports a range of specialist services which offers direct support to children and young people who have experienced domestic abuse. Uh, the officer, member can be assured that this government uh, will be unrelenting in its commitment uh, to make sure that we continue to tackle all forms of domestic violence that are perpetrated against uh, women and uh, girls. Thanks. Rhoda Grant, briefly, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when you publish the research commissioned on commercial sexual exploitation, and when the symposium into that research will take place? Uh, some of that work is uh, coming to its completion, so uh, part of the uh, stakeholder meetings uh, that were due to take place uh, were due to complete, uh, be completed this month. Uh, and once that work is then being uh, undertaken, and we have engaged with all of the various stakeholders, we will then be in a position to consider the final paper uh, that comes from the research and the work that we have engaged in uh, with other stakeholders. Thanks. Question 7. The name of Lewis MacDonald has not been lodged and an explanation has been provided. Question 8. Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government what action the Cabinet Secretary for Justice will take to allow survivors of child abuse in care prior to 1964 Minister to seek Paul compensation. Wheelhouse. I will respond to the members' questions since I have responsibility uh, for the policy on time bar, and I have had the opportunity to engage with survivors. As the member will know, uh, this is a complex and sensitive issue. I have heard personally from survivors about the difficulties they have experienced in trying to raise a claim in the civil courts, and I can very much understand their feelings of injustice. 
This is why I intend to lift the three-year limitation period from civil actions in cases of historic child abuse. And as we have already uh, previously committed, a draft bill will be published before the end of this parliamentary session. As Mr Gray is aware, the limitation period only applies to actions based on harm that occurred after the 26th of September 1964. For any harm that occurred before this date, the law of prescription applies. We gave serious consideration to the removal of the law of prescription, but the legal issues for these cases were too difficult to overcome. Uh, we are, are of the view that to reverse the law of prescription would be incompatible with the European Convention of Human Rights. I know that this has come as a great disappointment to many survivors and I can understand their frustration. However, the legal issues in respect to prescription mean that there appears to be no viable legislative solution for the pre-1964 cases. We are, however, looking at what else can be done for survivors in this group, which includes looking closely at experiences in other jurisdictions, and this work is ongoing. Thanks. Mr Gray, briefly, please. Thank you. No one doubts the complexities, but in the recent meeting with uh, survivors uh, held by the Cabinet Secretary for Education, she did say that prior to Parliament rising, a paper would be produced with those options for potential action. Is that still the intention of the Scottish Government? Minister, briefly, if you I, can. I can confirm, yes, uh, Ms Constant met with survivors on the 11th of February and uh, she has committed to showing prog progress in this work before Parliament dissolves. Many thanks. And that concludes that item of business. And we'll now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 15693 in the name of John Swin.